Hello and welcome to this Institute for Government event expert panel entitled How Not to Run a Government. I'm Hannah White and I'm the newly appointed director of the Institute for Government. So, from you turning on budgets to sacking chancellors, spooking the markets and watching borrowing rates climb, it has been a dramatic, chaotic and for many people very worrying start to Liz Truss's time as Prime Minister. Has Jeremy Hunt done enough to restore faith in the government's handling of the economy? What mistakes were made in the transition between Boris Johnson's number 10 and Truss's administration? Why were Truss and Kwarteng so quick to disregard the value of institutions? And how should a prime minister change course when things go wrong? I'm delighted to be bringing together an expert panel of uh, my IFG colleagues to discuss these important questions and to really explore the lessons that we all need to learn from the first 40 days in number 10 for Liz Truss. So joining me on the panel, I have our chief economist, Gemma Tetlow, program director, Alex Thomas, and our senior fellows, Jill Rutter and Kath Haddon. Now, some housekeeping before we start. Thank you to all those joining us at short notice in the room. Uh, whether you're in the room or online, please start thinking about the questions you have for the panel. Um, and you can send those in via Slido. And please, uh, if you would like to, add your name and let us know where you are asking your question from. We will be live tweeting from IFG events uh, using the hashtag IFG Trust. Um, so do uh, f follow and tweet if you wish to. And we'll have a video and a sound recording of this event on our website within 24 hours. So broadly speaking, what we're going to do, we've got an hour. We're going to start by looking back a little bit at uh, what's gone wrong, and then we're going to switch to looking forward, what happens next, and what lessons should be learned. So Gemma, I'm going to start with you, perhaps predictably. Um, can you just take us through your assessment of the, of the mistakes that uh, Kwarteng and Trust made uh, with the mini-budget? As we persist in calling it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, it's very, very far from being a mini-budget, as many people have said. but. I, mean, I think there were sort of three sets of mistakes that they made in the mini budget. The first was in rushing to make the announcements so quickly. Um, I think that mattered for two reasons. The first was that they didn't have very long to get full and detailed briefing from the Treasury on what the likely impact of the sorts of measures that they were thinking about were actually going to have and to think about whether they really were going to deliver the sorts of growth that they aspired to have. But also it meant that they didn't have time to roll the pitch with either their own MPs or the public to really get people to understand what it was they were trying to achieve and get support behind those measures. Because they'd really only, this trust had really only tested those types of measures with a pretty narrow group of Conservative Party members during the leadership campaign over the summer who'd um, given their support to her. Um, the second set of problems I think there were was in rushing to announce permanent tax cuts without either setting out the spending cuts that you would have alongside those as part of a shift towards a smaller state vision, which seemed to be part of what Trust wanted, um, and also without doing providing an OBR forecast for what that set of measures meant for the long-term sustainability of the public finances. Um, and without that, people were very sceptical about whether this package of measures, as outlined in the mini-budget, was actually consistent with fiscal sustainability, um, not least because since the OBR produced their last set of forecasts back in March, the outlook for the economy has worsened significantly. So there were lots of independent forecasters saying there was probably already a hole in the public finances, not the sort of headroom that Sunak had had back in March. And then layering on top of that further tax cuts left the public and financial markets unconvinced that this was really fiscally credible. Um, and that was part of what we saw in the market reaction. And thirdly, I think compounding all of that, having spent the summer questioning the orthodoxy of the Treasury, the credibility of the OBR, the credibility and independence of the Bank of England, just added to a perception that this was a government that wasn't, didn't feel bound by the constraints that previous governments have had on them of the need to make difficult choices in the public finances. So all of that, I think, contributed to concern in the financial markets and more broadly that actually this government's plans weren't consistent with fiscal sustainability. Thank you. And Alex, so you lead our civil service work. Um, Gemma mentioned there at the start, thinking about what use um, Liz Truss and Cosi Quadding did or didn't make of the civil service. What, what do you think went wrong in terms of relationships with the civil service and, and in particular maybe the way in which number 10 has been set up? 
Mm, yeah. Uh, and I also, I mean, I completely agree with what Jim was saying about speed there as well, which applies to, to the civil service and the, the use of civil service uh, advice. I think, um, I mean, I started uh, when the trust came into uh, office being sort of quite optimistic about uh, some of the <clears throat> way that the relationships with the civil service might work because it was clear that the trust government had a clear objective and uh, it's almost a truism in these sorts of circumstances that the civil service responds well to clear leadership and a, and a, and a clear ob objective. Um, uh, perhaps that was a, a bit naive. Um, uh, it obviously much commented on a dismissal of Tom Scholar, uh, experienced permanent secretary at the Treasury Centre, signal uh, then that um, uh, the trust government saw the civil service, saw the Treasury as part of the um, orthodoxy that they wanted to, um, uh, to, to tackle and to push back against. But I think the thing that they've learnt, we've all learnt, uh, we've been making the point, lots of people have been making the point that if you had hugged the civil service closer, if you had used the civil service and uh, the advice that it gives to really test out some of the pros and cons, the risks of a policy, if you'd done the same with um, the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Bank of England, uh, then you both would have ended up with a better, more sustainable policy going to some of the points that Gemma was making, but you'd also have kind of embraced that architecture that is part of reassuring the financial markets and others that it's a government that's going to take rational decisions in a way that, uh, in a, in a way that, um, uh, that works out well. So I certainly think that uh, I'm not sure they could have got away with everything that they were trying to do in the mini maxi budget, um, but if they'd uh, hugged the civil service and those other institutions closer, it would have given them more space to, to manoeuvre. You also asked about, about number 10, and I think um, uh, again, I, I don't think there was anything inherently wrong in some of what they were trying to do about slimming down number 10, making it really clear who the decision makers were, um, uh, maybe you know, fewer chiefs and, uh, uh, and more uh, cl organisational uh, clarity. <clears throat> but I think what it's clear they also lost in that number 10 uh, clear out was uh, experience and um, uh, or the authority of the advisors in number 10. So again, I think one of the lessons that you draw out of how to run the centre of government from the last 40 days and 40 nights is that, um, that you need to retain uh, experience, capability, both civil service and um, political special advisor from number 10. Final quick point is I think that's also played out in some of the communications that we've seen coming from centre of government, but also more uh, generally. Um, I think you know, it hasn't helped that there's clearly a chief of staff who's recusing himself from matters left, right and centre because of his, uh, of his former involvement in, in lobbying. Um, I also think there's been some uh, kind of naivety around the communications. Seeing ministers and the prime minister seem to try and claim that black is white and white is black um, uh, hasn't helped Re, you know, provide that reassurance and stability that Jeremy Hunt now this morning is, um, is, is talking about. I also think it's tripped them up in other policy areas. This might be a small example, but seeing um, Therese Coffey's um, uh, uh, sort of announcement over the weekend about changing the way that antibiotics are, um, uh, are administered with pharmacists, maybe that's perfectly sensible. But to have that kind of mixed up in some story about her doling out um, uh, antibiotics to her friends shows a sort of a lack of grip and a lack of experience in some of the communication. It's very interesting, and I, I, it makes me reflect as, you, as you're talking about. There's a there's a difference between transitions between governments when you're staying with the same overall party, and between governments because mm. some of the stuff you're talking about in terms of retaining expertise and so on in number ten, I guess would apply differently if you were moving after a general election. But but Hannah, we did see that before actually with the transition between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, where Gordon Brown had a number of false starts in his setup of number ten, precisely because he exited all the Blair advisors, though you could say actually that was even less of an ideological shift than that between Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. So it does seem to be something that rather bizarrely even characterised intra-party transitions. And I think one of the things I think is really interesting in number 10 is that one of the big criticisms of Boris Johnson's government was that it was a campaigning government not a, and had never cracked how to govern. And yet... Liz Truss appoints her chief of staff, somebody who is a campaigner, not somebody with any experience of government. And you would have thought, if one of the lessons you might have taken out of the Johnson years was you actually need some people who know how to make the machine work properly, and yet you discard a lot of those in your early, uh, early days. I guess by the time she came into government, she felt she was almost back into the campaigning moment with only two years to go. But I wanted to ask you, 
Jill, you worked in the Treasury. Um, we've, we've, we've touched on this. The Treasury civil servants are now working to their fourth set of ministers this year. What conclusions do you think we can draw about the role that the Treasury has played in this um, new trust administration? Well, I think it's probably, probably changing quite a lot. I think the Treasury will have been, uh, this isn't based on inside information, but I think the Treasury will have been shell-shocked to see Thomas Scholar dismissed in the way he was. Um, there have been some you know, rumours before under Boris Johnson that Tom Scholar was for the chop, but he survived and indeed proved his worth, I think, with the furlough scheme under Rishi Sunak. Um, I think you know, that would have left the department leaderless. They'd also just lost their second permanent secretary, Charles Roxburgh, who decided to spend more time uh, in America with his wife, who's our ambassador there. So the Treasury had lost its number one and number two. And one of the things that I think is really, really interesting with the new top team at the Treasury, with James Bowler, Bess Russell, both long-term Treasury civil servants, and Kat Little, who came in from outside via uh, the Ministry of Defense, I think, is that they all come from the spending tax side of the Treasury. You know, there are very few people at the top of the Treasury uh, at the moment who are experienced in reading the markets, dealing with market participants, dealing with the Bank of England, all of those sorts of things. And the government actually discarded, in that sense, the best asset it had on day one. I thought it was very interesting, the briefing over the weekend, which suggested that Sajid Javid made a commitment to reinstate Tom Scholar as permanent secretary, one of his conditions for potentially referring as chancellor. Obviously, those rumours have been dismissed. But I think it is quite interesting that people who had been inside the Treasury potentially saw that losing that sort of knowledge and expertise, uh, which they, you know, will grow, but isn't there instantaneously, was a bit of a, bit of a wrong move there. So I think the Treasury will now, I think, probably be feeling quite comfortable with Jeremy Hunt. Uh, we'll probably feel much more comfortable with the sort of messages Jeremy Hunt has been giving out on, uh, on Friday and, on, uh, and today. And I think one of the really interesting things about the faux pas of the unnecessary, if you like, rushed mini budget, as opposed to the energy package, was that the government has now really you know, condemned itself to have to be more orthodox than the economic orthodoxy because they have to overcompensate for that initial rush to disruption. Kath, you think a lot about um, the role of ministers um, and we've had some examples of ministers coming into government. I guess they had a, potentially, they've, the set of government uh, of ministers trust brought in will have felt they had a bit of notice. They could see over the summer that you know, potentially she was, she was in the lead in the leadership campaign, so they had some time to think potentially about the roles they might be about to play. But what do you think are the main sort of lessons that we ought to learn from transition between governments? I um, think, I mean, this, in a sense, an ex extraordinary case study in how a transition can go badly wrong. Um, because doing all the preparation work that you would normally do in the run-up to taking office, you know, in a leadership campaign, um, it both doesn't give you the time uh, to do sort of proper thinking about, you know, what, what your programme for government might be. There were a lot of meetings at evening towards the end of the process when it seemed likely that Liz Truss would get it, but still you are, you are off campaigning. It means that policy, compared to opposition where, yes, you're trying to win an election, you're developing a manifesto, but in a leadership contest, your policy is almost being developed through the campaign in order to win the campaign. And that boxes you in, in all sorts of different ways. I think also, as, as Alex said, you know, it, it means that a lot of the people that you're bringing into government are the people that won you the campaign because you have loyalty to them, because you've been working with them throughout all of that. So again, you're not thinking about the difference between people for campaign versus people for government. But mostly, um, I think two things. One, it just shows that the gap between a cabinet position and prime minister is huge. And former cabinet ministers who then step up to it often struggle to realize that just because you've been watching number 10 and the previous prime minister from the outside does not mean that you know better how to do it. And secondly, this point that you made about speed. I remember back in 2009 when 
Peter and I were first writing about transitions, and we bemoaned endlessly the, the sort of concept of the 100 days philosophy. You know, this FDR idea that you've got to hit the ground running and just launch a load of stuff. Now, of course, any new government that's coming in is going to want to, you know, catch the eye of the public, reassure them. Uh, they're going to want to fill the grid. They're going to want to have stuff that they can put out. But it's understanding the difference between announcements you can make, consultations launched, uh, direction of travel, you know, the, even when it's big ticket things, things that you have had time to work on versus suddenly doing policy in a hurry soon after taking office when you haven't had time to even test out whether the people around you are telling you the right things. And, you know, if, if I could have sort of one suggestion about transitions for people coming into government, it is that. Think through the speed at which you want to do things because when it goes wrong and you have to reverse course to the scale that they are doing at the moment, there is no coming back from that. So if it means you have to take more time, okay, maybe it's not as glitzy and glamorous as you wanted it to be coming into office, but maybe it means that the policy you're putting in place is more robust and is more likely to survive the test of time. It comes back a bit, doesn't it, to the point you just made, Hannah, as well, about coming in from opposition or coming in from other governments. If you've come in from opposition, you might have had four or five years to work up, test some of the policy initiatives, Bank of England, independence, or, or whatever. If you're coming in from a short campaign, um, uh, within the same government. it's uh, Yeah, or at least realise the difference, because remember, the, the contact with the civil service during the campaign would have been minimal. Um, you know, yes, these were ministers, serving ministers, um, but they were off campaigning, so most of the, the sort of policy positions set out in the campaign would have been developed amongst a small group of people. And, and we know this, you know, it's not just during the campaign. Liz Truss has been talking about these issues for years. These are sort of deeply held um, political beliefs. So it's not like they just came out of nowhere. But it is then only in the sort of final stages where the civil service did access talks with the two candidates and they were able to start sort of discussing what they were able to do. But as Alex knows, you know, it was very difficult and it is very difficult for the civil service to push back, especially when a campaign is riding high and you know, amongst the electorates or selectorate, whatever you want to call it, that she was targeting, she did very well. So from the civil services position, it's hard to push back against that and say, well, I don't know. And that's obviously what we've seen play out quite a lot. Can I just pick up on this, this point about policy making? Because Jill, you've done a lot of work on policy making, in particular tax policy making. Um, what what are the what should we take away from this whole episode about tax policy making which okay this looks like a spectacularly bad example of how to do it but i think some of the things that went wrong aren't that dissimilar from the things that otherwise go wrong in terms of tax policy making well we know that there's a sort of you know uh, a widespread and cross-party addiction to the famous budget rabbit and to be able to surprise people and indeed uh, Kwasi Kwarteng could say quite a lot of the changes he introduced on the 23rd of September were well trailed, the corporation tax reversal, the cancelling of the NICS rise and stuff, 45p tax rate change, which of course the first reversal was I think his big budget rabbit, though I have to say I was on a plane out of the country as he made that statement, absolutely not causally linked. So, you know, there is a tendency to do this in secret. A lot of people were saying, oh, well, they didn't discuss it with the cabinet. You know, isn't that a shock horror probe? But actually, budget's never discussed with the cabinet, so that's just business as usual. <laughs> it's bad business as usual, but it is business as usual. I think what was really intriguing about the mini-budget was the government did have to act quickly mm. on the energy price support package, which they then reverted to saying, well, that was the big measure. And that was a big measure. They uh, what they them. didn't need to do uh, was the 23rd of... Um, September statement, adding all these other things in, because really intriguingly, and we see it now in the uh, now in the Jeremy Hunt's reversal this morning, is many of those changes weren't due to take effect in any case till April. They could have been done in a November budget, prepared in the proper way, maybe a bit of pitch rolling, maybe a bit of looking at the numbers and seeing how they were moving and whether you really, really wanted to make them a priority now, how you might balance them when you actually had a realistic grip of what you could do on the spending side, which by dint of doing one half of the equation so much in advance, they lost their ability to say how they were paying for it through spending cuts or other tax adjustments or, or whatever. So I think it was 
the desire, presumably, to get some momentum into the Conservative Party conference and show that they were serious about this disruption mm. agenda and were serious about doing things different, differently. But the problem was <coughs> that it fell apart really so quickly. And it seemed to fall apart, watching from overseas, fall apart on the Friday, but then fall apart over the weekend when Kwasi Kwarteng, rather than sort of try and calm everything, doubled down and said, there's lots more of this sort of thing to come. And that possibly wasn't the world's most reassuring message when it was already going a bit off track. What I don't know was how, how much of a warning they had, because as Gemma said, the public finance has clearly deteriorated enormously since you know, everybody was talking about how do you spend that headroom that Rishi Sunak appeared to have in, the, uh, in March. I don't know whether they had real warnings of quite how bad numbers were starting to look and the things that uh, the chance took, or whether he just really didn't want to know and put his hands over his ears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I th on that, it's, he presumably didn't have an updated forecast from the OBR because he didn't ask for one at that point, although they were, they had started to put one together. And they offered, I think. They had, they they had <laughs> offered him one. I, th I think it stretches belief a bit much to think that he wasn't or couldn't be aware that things had got worse because we, the IFS, Resolution Foundation, many others had been talking about the fact that £30 billion of headroom was unlikely to still be there. So I think it... Yeah. Yeah. I was going to come on, Gemma, to ask you, to flip into the sort of more forward-looking part of this, where we are now. <laughs> We've had a statement, obviously, from uh, Jeremy Hunt to camera uh, this morning and we're expecting a, a statement in Parliament possibly after a UQ to Liz Truss um, this afternoon, where hopefully we'll get some more detail and um, some, some questioning from MPs. But yeah, what, where would you say we are on uh, Monday, just after lunch? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Monday, just after lunch, I mean, on the substance of the mini budget, we have now had large parts of it reversed. So the, the only bits that really survive of the mini budget were the reversal of the health and social care levy on national insurance and the stamp duty cut. Um, so they've reversed something like £26 billion of measures from the 45 that were in the mini budget. They've also announced an actual tax increase relative to Rishi Sunak's plans, which is that we're now going to stick at 20% basic rate income tax rather than going down to 19% in a couple of years' time. Um, they have also put been keen to now say that they will publish an OBR forecast and they brought that forward to the end of October to try and reassure people that they are going to be bound by that and want to look at the outlook of that. I agree with Jill, I think this leaves the OBR and the Bank of England stronger than they were before this government took office, precisely because of the loss of credibility on the government side. Um, but despite the reversals of the tax policies, from the numbers that have been flying around about what the new forecasts are likely to look like, it does seem that Hunt still probably has something like 30 to 40 billion pounds of further savings to find, whether that's spending cuts or further tax rises, um, which is presumably going to be the focus of the next couple of weeks until we get to the 31st of October. So that's pretty big decisions. Um, uh, I'm sure we can come on to talk about from our performance track that we put out today with um, SIPFA. Um, that looks at the current state of public services and how they've been faring post-pandemic. And that paints a pretty difficult picture for this government in terms of where, you, if you want to find spending cuts, how you do that. Um, one chunk of things you could do would be to look at the welfare budget. Um, so far, the political noises on that are not very good. Um, Liz Truss said she wanted to stick with the triple lock on pensions. If you do that, that rules out about half of the welfare budget from cuts. The other half is working age benefits. And again, during the Conservative Party conference, there were quite a few, including cabinet ministers, coming out and saying they wouldn't support cuts to welfare spending. If you rule out all of that, you're left with public services. And as I say, our performance tracker analysis today shows the difficulties the government faces there. So we have, looking across the major public services, most of them are performing worse than they were on the eve of the pandemic. And in turn, that means they were performing worse than they were sort of at the beginning of the decade of austerity. Um, and the spending plans that are currently in place for the next three years, which when Boris Johnson announced them uh, back in September last year, 
they were supposed to be relatively generous to actually help services to meet some of the backlog from the pandemic and to improve the quality of services. But high inflation and pressure for higher pay rises since then means that actually those spending plans aren't even enough to kind of get us back to the quality of services that we had on the eve of the pandemic, both because of future demands that are expected to crop up over the next few years and because of the existing backlogs and things in the services that are going to require more spending to catch up on. So you're in a position where services are already struggling to perform as we want them to. Um, so it's unlikely there are any easy low-hanging fruits of efficiency savings that you can make after a decade of austerity. Um, so I think, and Jeremy Hunt sort of has started using these words, but I think the government really seriously has to be thinking about what do we not do or what do we accept is going to be just more limited scope or quality of services than we've offering, been offering before. You can't pretend that this is all coming from pain-free efficiency savings. The other big chunk of public spending that they could look to cut back on would be investment spending, where Boris Johnson did have plans to increase investment spending to a much higher level than we've seen in recent history. Um, so you could cut that back, save quite a bit of money, um, and get it have something more like recent levels of investment spending. But again, that's not terribly easy for this government to do and square with, firstly, pledges to spend on defence, which is one of our big investment spending items. Liz Truss has said she wants to increase spending on defence. Um, and also a government that really wants to boost economic growth. A lot of investment spending does contribute to stronger economic growth, so it's difficult to square that. Yeah, and I think Jeremy Hunt is also quite keen on defence spending, isn't he, as well? So. Kath, can I come to you? In terms of um, looking forward, obviously this is not a situation any government would have wanted to sort of end up in. So from a kind of uh, ministerial way forward point of view, what, what would your advice be? We saw a lot of, should we say, lack of message discipline uh, among uh, ministers during the Conservative Party conference, a bit of a, seemed to be, whether it was a breakdown in collective responsibility given they hadn't necessarily been con consulted on what had been done up to that point. But what are the, what are the key th strategies, do you think, going I mean, it's, it's a really interesting test for cabinet government. You know, for years now, we keep hearing arguments about how everything's becoming more and more prime ministerial or presidential or whatever. <laughs> Um, and now we have a Prime Minister who is wholly reliant on her cabinet to try and shore her up with her party. And I think we just heard you've got Penny Morden coming out <laughs> to do the urgent question this afternoon um, in place of the Prime Minister as the opposition requested. Um, so, and, and meanwhile, you had obviously Jeremy Hunt fronting up the press conference earlier, de earlier today and very clearly showing himself as sort of quite authoritative um, in terms of how much he is driving government policy now. So it's a really tricky balancing act for the Prime Minister. Um, Liz Truss has brought these people in. She seems comfortable with them doing as they're doing at the moment. You've got to assume that she's been part of the decision to have various cabinet ministers writing in Sunday and papers over the weekend. Um, but all of it will come down to sort of parliamentary handling, I think. Um, so that's probably going to be more of an issue rather than anything to do with collective responsibility or anything like that, because so much of the Prime Minister's authority has been eaten away. It's really now about who comes to sort of prop her up rather than um, who might do her down. Yes, and it does seem her authority in terms of getting that stuff through is going to be a problem. So I thought one of the really interesting questions, and we were talking about the mini budget or maxi budget and the extent of cabinet involvement there, which there was clearly absolute minimal, but I do think it's really interesting how they manage the sort of reversals. One of the things that was very noticeable, um, being old enough to remember Black Wednesday and being in number 10 then, albeit in the wrong building, because the Prime Minister wasn't working from Downing Street, is that John Major, when he and Norman Lamont were doing their last desperate attempts to keep Sterling in the exchange rate mechanism, they insisted on having the people who would like to be the biggest uh, critics of those moves in the cabinet meeting with them. So they had a Ken Clark, they had Michael Hazeltine and people. And the phrase used at the time, Ken Clark's phrase, was, you know, we were all there to dip our hands in the blood. And I think one of the really interesting questions for Liz Truss is, does she have the sort of power convening authority for her, maybe her and Jeremy Hunt, if it's now, have to regard as a sort of 
do person writ or whatever you would call it, um, dual leadership, uh, co-premiership, uh, do they actually really involve the rest of the cabinet not saying go out and promote this on Twitter, but actually in the decision making and particularly, and as Gemma says, they come up to those really difficult decisions they're having to make over the next two weeks of how to make these numbers add up and the very difficult decisions that they're going to be, whether on the tax side or on the spending side. Because I think you know, if they can really pull this off as a collective effort and show they can make that work, then survival prospects may be rated slightly higher than they are now. But if they can't and it just descends into acrimony and things like that, there are resignations or whatever, then I think it's further trouble. I mean, ben Wallace has already been sort of briefing that you know, it's an absolute sticking point for him sticking to the 3% defence yeah. commitment. Yeah, I'd be very surprised if she makes, I mean, presuming she continues for some weeks mm. and months, I'd be very surprised she makes it without resignations on policy points because they are going to have to make such hard decisions, but I think it is whether or not a core of the Conservative Party, particularly ministers around her, can help stabilise the government, um, and which is why, like I say, it's going to be a really interesting uh, example of cabinet government. Alex, just before I come to, to questions from the audience and from Slido, um, what, if anything, has Liz Trust done right? What lessons should we learn um, from things that have gone well? Well, there we go. Yes, it's very important to be balanced, isn't it, in these, uh, uh, in these things, although it is only, only 40 days. Um, uh, I did a uh, possibly ill-advised uh, tweet the other day that got a little bit of gentle uh, flack um, because uh, sort of suggesting that there were a few things that were it not for the mini maxi budget, we might be saying, well, actually, the early signs from this uh, government are um, good. And there were uh, plenty of people saying, um, uh, uh, saying, well, you know, apart from... Apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Was the kind of you know was the was the perfectly correct response? But I was sort of doing that to make the point that actually, uh, you know, the mini budget was such a big mistake; it, it crowded everything else out. And I wouldn't want to overegg this, but there were some interesting signs early doors from this government. The relationship with the EU and the Northern Ireland Protocol, the temperature seemed to be coming out of that a little bit. Um, the barristers pay dispute uh, uh, had been called off and there were more constructive signs coming from some of the talks with the uh, rail unions and, uh, and others. Um, it was only a briefing, but some of the civil service bashing that we'd um, seen from Jacob rees mogg over the last six months or so was being rowed back with Nadim Zahawi and Edward Arger, now uh, moved to the Treasury as Chief Secretary, um, talking about continuing to make um, uh, cuts in the civil service, but doing it in a slightly more measured and thoughtful um, way. The energy support, uh, windfall tax, even if Jacob rees mogg doesn't want to call it a windfall tax. The, the handling of uh, the Queen's death, I think, uh, was, you know, was, was fine. And you know, Liz Truss didn't put herself in the middle of that in a way that caused criticism. So it was more sort of tonal than anything else. But I do think, had we not had this sort of uh, you know, complete explosion on the 23rd of September, we might be saying, well, actually, here's a government that is starting to feel its way into some of these impossible issues that, it's, uh, that, it's, um, that it needs to address. I, I, I wonder a little bit if some of that was the influence of civil servants and others operating on Liz Truss and the new government saying, look, here are some of the kind of wicked problems that you need to, that you need to address. And here's what we've been thinking and that we kind of couldn't get through the Johnson administration, but here are some fresh ideas on how to handle some of these. Uh, but obviously that has, has its limits. A point that came to mind was, as, as others were talking, was, was one that Tim Durrant, our colleague, uh, made uh, when we were talking earlier, which was that this, you know, this certainly gives the lie to civil servants in the Treasury being enormously obstructionist or, um, uh, or kind of refusing to, uh, to go along with government policy because uh, I, I would be very surprised if, if uh, a lot of the content of the mini-budget was, um, was, was related to civil servants. But there, are, there were just a few threads, I think, that we can draw out that were the beginnings of promising, uh, uh, promising trust policies. Thank you, Alex. So I can see we've got one question here, Penny, and then one in the front row. The gentleman over there will take uh, them in. My name's Andrew, Andrew Edwards, and I work for Sustain, and we take a great interest in government work and the DWP. I was fascinated with Jill and Kath's comment about training, because you've got Martin McGuinness and Ian there. They were given preparation for government training before they became first and deputy first minister. And I wondered, given that Liz had been chief secretary to the Treasury, 
Was there any kind of preparation for training? I believe she had a, a chat with Boris. And normally, I agree that you'd normally see pictures of her writing the letters to our nuclear submarines and everything like that when they first get elected. But none of that seemed to happen. And I just wondered, what did she do that seduced, and I was at Wembley, that seduced the vast majority of Conservative Party selectorate to vote for her? Because I was at Wembley, and Rishi was the best candidate. Um, Robert Morland. Robert Morland, I'm a former member of the European Parliament, but I'm also recently a former president of Gloucester Conservative Association, which is probably more relevant. Um, my question is quite simply, did she underestimate her parliamentarians? I mean, the first thing she did was have no Rishi supporters in her cabinet. Um, I think five of the six MPs in my county, Gloucestershire, were vigorous opponents of her. And um, I met, actually, the former Solicitor General at the weekend. Um, I won't repeat some of our conversation. And I think this continues on. I mean, that's why I think it's difficult, very difficult, to see her staying. What do you think? <laughs> and Penny, just one gentleman. That... Hello, my name's David Middleton. Uh, I used to be chairman of the trustees of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And the first point I want to make is I think Truss's analysis of what is wrong is more or less correct. And I was really shocked by Jill Rutter saying she thought the Treasury now would be more comfortable. We are in a hell of a mess. And for the Treasury to be comfortable with the mess to which they've contributed so badly, I think is truly shocking. And I'm really worried about that. One point hasn't been made, the political point. She's only got two years left. When I think of Thatcher, who came in with, you could argue, a somewhat similar sort of revolutionary program, first of all, she won a big majority in the general election, which is very different. Second, the SDP was splitting the left-wing vote. So Thatcher had a pretty good idea. She might well have two terms. I mean. Poor old Truss only has two years at most, if one could say. And I haven't heard people talking about serious cuts in government spending. What about HS2? What about our nuclear program? What about privatizing the health service, which is a disaster? People never talk about that. So I think we're all living in fairyland, saying, let's go back to good old declinist normal. Truss isn't fitted for that. Can't you find some mediocre centrist politician? This reminds me very much of Reginald Maudling. I remember talking to him 60 years ago, and I was very young then, of course. I was younger than I am now. Um, <laughs> but I thought, my God, this man, a senior in the Conservative Party, could easily be a Labour MP. He's absolutely in the middle. You can't tell the difference. And I feel that now with all these wretched Conservative backbenchers who won't support um, planning changes. They won't support anything really worth doing. They insist on... Um, benefits being kept pace with inflation. I don't hear them talking about tax thresholds keeping pace with inflation. That's not on their agenda. It's redistribute the whole time. Nothing about where the redistribution growth is going to come from. Sorry, that wasn't a question. It was really a comment. <laughs> well, we can still get some re reaction. Um, OK, so we've got a uh, question on preparation for government. Has did this trust, was she properly prepared? Uh, did she underestimate her parliamentarians? I think maybe those two are maybe ones for Kath to kick off with. Then I'll give Jill an opportunity to respond yeah. and then anyone else who wants to come in on that. Yeah, so um, on two of the points actually, which also goes to that about she's only got two years and, and so forth. It goes to that point about she needed to take the party with her. So it's, it's one thing to have a very different approach uh, to government. Um, but the question is not just whether you have the mandate for it, but also do you have the numbers mm. for it? And, you know, even before um, the leadership contest kicked off, it was quite obvious that the Conservative Party was splitting on lots of different factions, lots of different policy areas. So whoever won it was going to have to bring those together. And, and that also goes to the point that we've been talking about in terms of speed. If you wanted to have a complete mm. change of direction... Um, or do dramatic new policy, then you've got to think about how you can actually get to the point of doing that. Did the tax changes have to happen so soon after taking office, 
or do you stabilise over a winter crisis and then look to take them? But I completely take the point that it, with two years mm. to go, there was obviously a desire to just roll the dice and to gamble that you do something big and bold now, perhaps take a bit of a hit, but over time that puts you in a stronger position in two years than if you just wait, which is, I assume, what the philosophy was behind it. Which kind of answers the point about, yes, I think she did underestimate the party. I'm not it, as... Parliament. Sorry, Parliament. Um, I think it's her party in particular within it. Um, and I think the key question is obviously about the sort of Rishi supporters in, in, um, in Cabinet. But I, I don't think the calculation was entirely, I only want the people loyal to me. She did bring in other uh, of her, you know, contenders, Penny Mordaunt um, being probably the most high profile of them, um, or the one with the biggest sort of faction behind her, but Kemi Badnock as well. Um, but the problem there was also what she saw with um, Greg Hans when she brought him in. If you've got people who've just come out with lots of statements saying how terrible you are, it's quite difficult then to get them to go out in front uh, you know, news programmes. So I think there was probably a practical element to it as well that perhaps has been underestimated in her calculations, um, but clearly did still mis you know, underestimate it. And then going to the point about transition uh, and training, I mean, it, it's the point I made earlier about how a minister, cabinet minister, experienced cabinet minister, they look at number 10, they think I can do that better. Uh, and oftentimes new prime ministers come in and they say, oh, well, I want to do everything that the previous person did wrong, I'm going to do completely different. And that does have a baby and bathwater problem with it because they don't retain what is actually successful uh, about long-standing sort of organisational parts of whether, it, you know, number 10, the centre or whatever. I agree with Alex that the, the sort of, you know, the jury is still out on whether the, the bigger changes to number 10 and cabinet office are still there. Uh, are, were part of the problem or resolvable. But I do think just that understanding um, of how different the job of PM is, I think a lot of people underestimate that. And they could have read my report on it, becoming <laughs> prime minister. So the opportunity was out there for them. Um, but yes, it is a problem. Let me just bring Gemma in quickly on something Kath said, and then... Sorry if I said something wrong. No, no. no, just on... on oh, OK, in which case, I'll go to your first. So. so I was going to go on to David. David, I think, you're, uh, you've, I think you've gone to 2001, and... Uh, oh, no, 2001. Uh, uh, what, I'm getting my years wrong. Two, uh, 1983 rather than 1979. 1979, Mrs Thatcher didn't have a big majority. It wasn't at all clear she was in command of her political, uh, parliamentary party. And although the first Howe budget... Uh, uh, dramatically reduced income tax rates, it put up VAT. Remember all that row about doubling VAT. No, we didn't double VAT from 8% to 16%. We took it to 15% and paid for it. So I think there's a really sort of different thing. So I think a lot of the government's problems were in the sequencing. Um, because I think if you wanted to make Liz Truss's project a success, what would you do? Uh, your advice as a, as a Treasury official, what you would do is first show you really can deliver some spending cuts that you have your cabinet behind it and you can deliver on your small state vision. You have the political appetite and the numbers to do it. Second, you actually start showing you can make a difference, not with airy fairy tales about growth, but you can actually do some of the things that independent observers might agree might contribute to tackling growth, whether it's immigration numbers, which is the quickest fix available, albeit quite unpalatable, or you bring in a major planning bill and you show you can get it past second reading in the Commons, I'm not convinced you can. But if you can, you do, in a such a way that you actually have a quite convincing story to tell on that side of the equation. Then I think you create bandwidth and you can say, well, you know, when these start to bear fruit, then we will be embarking on a tax-cutting agenda. <laughs> but I think the government's problem was that its growth plan, in a sense, consists of saying we will deliver 2.5% growth as though they were the first ever government to think growth might be good uh, without actually having a convincing set of measures with both the political wherewithal to deliver them and actually the policy underpinnings. Just quickly on the cabinet, I think we're uh, both the Johnson and the trust cabinets, I think, show that people, in a sense, learnt a bad lesson from Theresa May's travails, which was that you cannot afford a split cabinet. A split cabinet is a recipe for stasis and paralysis, and you therefore you basically have to pack your cabinet 
with your loyalists because they saw the Theresa May balanced cabinet fell into whatever. We've had multifactional cabinets before without as difficult an issue to get to grips with as Brexit. And I think you know, people do need to be able to create cabinets that reflect a wider balance of views in the party. One of the things that my colleagues at UK and Changing Europe show is that the views of Tory party members are really quite different to the views of Tory party MPs, and Tory party MPs are nearer the views of Tory party voters, which I think is really quite an interesting thing about the way in which leaders are selected by the Conservative Party. Thank you, Jill. Jill. Um, I think Jill put that very well about the sort of problems of the timing of um, Truss's announcements. I mean, just to illustrate I mean, the strange thing about what happened with Truss was that she somehow managed to burn through all her political capital with tax cuts, which you might have thought would be the one thing that would be relatively easy to get past um, Conservative MPs. There's something to get stronger growth, you need to tackle some of the thorny questions that Jill was talking about around planning reform, for example, and you could perhaps have constructed a set of policy measures in a different order differently where you used tax cuts to buy off opposition to other types of reforms, either within the tax system or elsewhere. So I agree that the, the timing seemed um, to be a big thing. On the sort of challenging the institutions, I think it's not, there are definitely critiques that one could make about the way that the Treasury functions, and that's something that we, we're planning to do more work on. I think it, it didn't seem to work to try and come in and just try and detonate and completely undermine the whole system. Um, I think there are, there are lots of strong aspects within the institutions, within the OBR, within the Treasury that could have helped this government deliver on its objectives. As Alex said, that in a sense, the civil service works quite well when it has a government that's very clear on what it's trying to achieve and slightly redirecting civil services activities could have been much more effective than just undermining them from the start. Right. Just, just one point on this, because I think others have covered the questions, other than to say that I love that, you know, I was at Wembley could be the new, I don't know, I was at Woodstock or I was at Glastonbury or something like that, but um, festivals. Um, no, the point I was going to make that sort of runs through three of those questions, but particularly thinking about the last one, is it feels to me like uh, a theme of the last three administrations has been an underestimation of the craft of government and uh, how you actually translate political objectives into uh, reality on the, uh, you know, in, in, on, on the ground. I would cut Theresa May's government a little bit more slack, not just because I work close to the centre of it, um, uh, but, the, uh, but the context was, um, was, was politically so uh, difficult without the majority after 2017 and with the Brexit um, uh, sort of polarisation. Um, but I do think all three administrations failed to have a governing, uh, a, a sort of ideologically based or you know, broader governing principle that they then had the skills through the cabinet, through parliamentarians to translate into action and change. I think May had a coherent agenda, burning injustices and just about managings and, and, and so on, but was, was stymied by Brexit and the 2017 election result. I think Johnson's style was not to create a clear um, direction, but almost to deliberately do the opposite, which worked for him for a time politically, but was undermined by his own ethical failings and uh, the sense of chaos that it created. Uh, and I think the Trust administration had a clear ideological underpinning, but um, undermined it just with extremely poor execution. So I think one of the things, we're at the IFG, that we should draw from this period, but also the last six years, is the importance of having a kind of well-grounded plan to execute when you're in government. No, Easy to say, harder to do. Say, <laughs> I'm going to take some questions from Slido now um, and just put them to some specific people and then we'll come back for some more in the room if there's time. So I've got a question from Louise, which I'm going to put to Gemma. Um, is there any political or economic scope now for investing in the sorts of sectors that would actually foster economic growth, such as education, science and technology, green tech, or are we in public spending and political stasis for the foreseeable future? I'll let you think about that one. Um, Jill, um, can departments move forward with anything given the current uncertainty or have we got now what we sort of saw over the summer? This is an anonymous question, which is why I've not attributed it. Um, uh, you know, a period in which government is not meaningfully doing anything because of the political controversy going on. Um, and then 
Finally, a question from uh, Martin Wheatley, uh, formerly of the IFG, uh, which I'm going to put to both Kath and to Alex. Have the events of the last weeks undermined irretrievably the reputation of the UK's governance and institutions? <laughs> That's a shared one. <laughs> Gemma, would you like to start? Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose there are two broad ways the government could go about trying to cut spending. One would be just to try and salami slice off everything. Um, and much better would be to think more strategically about what's the value of the different programs that we have and how do we, what are we most willing to give up and what has lowest benefit. And I would hope that that's what this government is now doing. I mean, we were having a bit, bit of debate earlier about how quickly does the government need to spell out its spending cuts to demonstrate credibility on this front. I think that there is an argument for waiting, for taking a bit longer and looking carefully and figuring out where to make those cuts rather than rushing into it and risking cutting the things that would actually deliver you the biggest longer term benefits. So setting a sort of objective, but actually working out where the least counterproductive things are to do. Yes, exactly. Jill. I think the government always needs to think quite carefully about uh, its business management, not least because we've seen such fragmentation in the Conservative Party in Parliament, such factionism. Uh, they'd always need to do that. So I think if you were sitting there, I don't think it need be an absolutely do nothing government, but it does need to think what its absolute priorities are with its new agenda and where it is going to be able to assemble majorities. Even Theresa May managed to do a few things in her parliaments and things on domestic abuse and things like that, where there the net zero target where there was a degree of sort of political cross-party consensus. So I think it needs to be a do-nothing government. I really do think it needs to think where it's going to expend its you know, diminished budget of political capital. And I do think if stability is the watchword, it needs to look at some of the things that might be contributing to instability. So one of the things that's been going around and David will no doubt uh, be worried about this too. But one of the things that's been going around on my Twitter feeds is today is does the government really want to proceed with the retained EU law bill, which a lot of businesses would regard as massively destabilizing. Whitehall will regard as a massive amount of work if we really have a sunset on all EU law of uh, the end of 2023. Remember, the Johnson government only wanted a sunset EU law by the end of 2026. And is that creating the right business environment, or would it be better to go back to, say, the Tigger report done by Ian Duncan Smith uh, and colleagues last year and say, where are the few sectors where the UK regulating very differently could really put some rocket boosters under the economy and could really make a difference? Would it be better to do that? So I think the government does need to go back and have a look again through its legislative programme to say, you know, where are we just going to get bogged down into meaningless fights and won't get anywhere? And where do we really want to uh, make progress? Thank you. Okay, Alex, I'm going to ask you first. Uh, has our reputation for the government suffered, or is this um, something which we can uh, retrieve? So it's to, yeah, to Martin's question, <coughs> it's suffered. Uh, I don't think it's been a good 40 days for um, uh, Britain's international uh, repu reputation. Martin's question used the word irretrievably. I don't think it's irretrievable. I think we've still got a strong uh, uh, and vibrant parliamentary system. I think we've got a civil service that needs major improvements, but that is fundamentally sort of committed to um, the public uh, good. Uh, so I think there are you know, strengths that the uh, UK can lean on. You could also say that the you know, rapid self-correction of uh, this government you know, has been able to take place. The pressure was applied to the Prime Minister. She was required to sack her Chancellor and replace another one who tentatively seems to be beginning to restore some confidence. So I think there are, you know, there are reasons to say that the systems are working, but it almost sort of comes back to that sort of uh, governance craft uh, point I was making, which I won't sort of pompously do again. But the, uh, I do think there are certain changes that we should be thinking really seriously uh, about IFG hobby horses here, but that would inject a little bit more um, uh, sort of confidence in our governing institutions. One of them could be to put the civil service on a more solid statutory um, basis uh, and to uh, change the incentives around how and where you give policy advice. I think another could be 
some of the stuff around training and uh, supporting uh, ministers. Another could be reforming the centre of government and the way the Treasury, the Cabinet Office, uh, uh, and number 10 uh, work together. So I think there are things that you could do incrementally to put it on a sounder basis. I think we've definitely taken a reputational um, hit, but I don't think it's irrecoverable. And I think actually one of the strengths of the British system is it, it wouldn't take that much, whether it's an election or recovering of trust stability or a new prime minister for, uh, you know, for the system to begin to reset itself and for people to feel quite a, quite a new and sort of restored sense of, um, uh, of, of st stability and effective government. And just building on that, in answering the same question, Kath, there's a question from Keith Raffin who says, now that the markets have begun to stabilise in response to the Chancellor's statement, wouldn't removing trust just destabilise them again? So wouldn't that be... I'm not going to be drawn on that, <laughs> Hannah, because we're in partial think tank and we don't do... The, we're not going to do the sort of wider political set. I mean, look, we... It's... You need a stable government. Whether that's with Truss or whether that's without her, that's a decision the Conservative Party need to take and they need to take it rapidly. But um, I don't think it's going to be a case of if they did decide to change her, suddenly you fixed all of this. We were talking earlier that a lot of the problem, it happened very rapidly, 40 days, but the problems now are going to take a lot of time to work their way through and to resolve. And that's true uh, whoever forms the next government or stays in government. Um, I mean, I agree with what Alex just said, particularly around our institutions. I was just recording a podcast where I was talking about the Heath government and sort of thinking about some of the comparisons to now. And I remember going through the Conservative Party files in the run-up to the 79 election where they were talking about ungovernability mm. of, the, you know, is the, the UK governable in the state that it's in? And no, we're nowhere near that level of discussion. Um, if anything, as we've been saying, it's reinforced the value of some of the yeah. institutions that we're talking about today. I think where it's really interesting, though, is, is around the role of politics. And there are a lot of academic scholars who are talking about, uh, they use the word hyper a lot, to talk about hyper-political or hyper this, hyper that. Uh, but it's, it's talking about the sort of speed, almost controversy, um, you know, the rise of populism, other things like that, or even just sort of knee-jerk responses towards populism. There is something very interesting, not just about what's happened, but how rapidly it's happened. Um, and I mean, going back to your point earlier, I think there is also a really interesting question about uh, the way in which Parliament is sort of conceived and governments engage with it. And we get accused of being sort of too pro-Parliament, but it is the root of our democracy. And we have seen yet another government that has failed to think through its strategy and processes for engaging its backbenches and understanding that a majority is just paper numbers unless you actually can get the votes on the floor of the House. So, yeah, there are important questions we need to take away from it, but it's not completely broken. A note of optimism. I think we'll draw it to a close there. I think um, I'd echo Kath's point she was making there. This all seems to have happened very fast, but I think we can all agree that actually what needs to be done to, to take steps back from where we seem to have got to in 40 days might take a little bit longer. Um, so... We will be here um, trying to offer our best suggestions on how to run a government well. Um, can I ask you all to join me in thanking the excellent panel? And just to encourage you uh, to have a look at our performance tracker report, as Gemma was talking about, out today, and really interesting analysis across nine public services uh, and how they are coping and, and really concludes that there's not much fat left to trim from public services in the aftermath of, of COVID and of uh, the current situation with uh, inflation and so on. So it's a fascinating read, so do go to our website and find that. And it just remains to thank everyone for joining us today.